All right, friend, friends, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel. We'll be looking in chapter 18, but we're going to be all over the place in the book of Samuel today. We'll start in chapter 18. We're going to end up in chapter 22. We're continuing our series through the life of David called Life and Lessons of a King. The title of today's message is Crutches and Cave. Well, I, I've managed to borrow some of these. I had uh, put it out on Facebook that I needed some crutches, and I had a lot of people worried about me for a while. But uh, no, Alicia has been good to me. But uh, uh, you know, when you when you you use crutches, you're using them because something's not quite working right. You use crutches when you can't quite put pressure where you want to put pressure at. And crutches help alleviate pain that you have and help you move forward. And as long as the crutches are working, you'll be all right. Crutches are made to hold you up when you can't hold yourself up. Now the problem is and the challenge is is that we all have crutches in our lives. If we're not careful, some of these life crutches end up holding us when God's supposed to be holding us. We have crutches that are substitutes for our great God. David was dealing with the loss of a lot of crutches in his life, and we're going to look at that in this passage. Specifically, I want to share about today is that We need to be letting go of substitutes for God, substitutes for who He is and what He can do in our life, and learning to trust Him in the ups and downs and the highs and lows of life. Well, I'll pray, and we'll get started. Join with me in prayer. Father, thank You for today. God, I thank You for this time. I thank You we've worshipped together in song worship you in prayer and so now we worship you through the study of your word what i pray that you'll speak through me or i pray that you'll help me to decrease lord and for you to increase what i pray that the spirit works in hearts father we ask these things in jesus name amen all right so we're going to be kind of moving fast here so if you've got your bibles hang on to them we're going to be in, in, a, in a lot of different places in samuel and uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, we've got some in the chairs or, or use your phone or whatever is easiest for you. But uh, the first scene that we see here in, in this particular section in David's life, we see David is losing the crutches that were holding him up. And a lot of this insight I got from Chuck Swindoll. He has a great book on the life of David. I'd encourage you to take a look at it. And he helped me think through this a little bit myself. But before we we get too far ahead, just catching us back up, remember, David has already defeated Goliath. Um, People were singing his praises, but Saul, the current king, uh, was a a loose cannon. He's already tried to to kill David and and, uh, will try to kill him many times more. And so David, uh, who was living in the lap of luxury, is all of a sudden in a very dangerous spot. So in verse 18 through 29, we see that Saul... It was David's enemy continually. In chapter 20, verse 3, David says that there is not but a step between me and death. So what was going well for David seems to be going very poorly all of a sudden. So let's look at some of the crutches that David loses. In chapter 19, follow along with me in verses 8 through 10, we see the loss of his position. Then there was war again. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a great blow. Then they fled from him. Then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his, in his hand. And David was playing the lyre. And Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he eluded Saul so that he struck the spear into the wall. And David fled and escaped that night. Remember, this is not the first time that he has thrown a spear. This would be the third time that he has tried to throw a spear at David and kill him. So David is losing his position. Um, he is in the, a, a royal court. This is as good as anybody could live 
in Israel at that time. He was a military leader and then a successful military leader. Uh, he was young, but he was unsuccessful in everything that he was doing because the Bible says that God was with them. People were literally singing his praises, <laughs> right? They were saying, man, David did this. He killed 1,000, 10,000, and Saul killed, killed 1,000. But, but uh, man, uh, but, but David, and they're singing his praises. I mean, that's pretty good. Living in the royal lifestyle, hanging around with the king. People, uh, girls singing to you. I mean, when you're single, that's a pretty good thing, right? David had it good. But David lost that. He lost this crutch that he was hanging on to. We see that David loses his wife. Look at verses 11 through 12. He was single, but he was quickly got married after uh, Saul's uh, working. Look at uh, verse 11 through 12. The Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him, but that, but that he might kill him in the morning. But Michael, David's wife, told him, if you do not escape with your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michael let David down through the window. He fled away and escaped. So this is the same guy that had killed Goliath. Um, he was promised one of Saul's daughters because he had done that. And so Saul sort of tricks him. He says, well, you can have this one. No, I'm not going to let you have that one. I'm going to let you have this other one. But the other one ends up loving him. And so David does what he's supposed to do. Saul said, you got to kill uh, 100 bad guys, 100 Philistines. And, he, and instead he kills 200 of them. And Saul was hoping that he would die. So this wife that, that he had won, that he had fought for, that she loved him and he loved her, was stripped away immediately out of his life. We see David loses his counselor, the trusted uh, crutch of a counselor. Look at uh, 19 verses uh, 18. And now David fled and escaped, and he came to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and lived in Naoth. And then look in verse 20, uh, in verse 1. Then David fled from Naoth and Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is my guilt and what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? So Samuel was this great godly leader. He, uh, remember, David, or David was chosen by Samuel. He said that you're going to be the next king. They, uh, Samuel was, was wise and good. He ran to Samuel. Then he had to flee from him as well. We see he loses the crutch of friendship. Look at a 20 verse 42. But then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, because we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord shall be between me and and you, and between my offspring and your offspring forever. And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went to the city. Now, the Bible, Jonathan's an exceptional character, and we're going to spend more time on what biblical friendship looks like, so we're going to come back to this passage uh, in future weeks. But the Bible never says one bad thing about Jonathan. Jonathan is this great, loyal, good-hearted, trusted friend, somebody that a, that a king, a future king, really needed in his life and Jonathan and that great friendship is stripped from his life he loses the, the crutch of friendship you ever lost a friend I mean it can really hurt I remember there was a guy in my life and I loved him and trusted him and there were some circumstances surrounding a lot of people that we're connected with and and man and I really trusted him and, and I thought in this 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 disagreement that we were having with all these people that surely he would have been on my side and then uh, one day he said, no, I, I, I disagree with you, and, and really separated himself. And I'm telling you, it was like being uh, drop-kicked emotionally in the stomach, man. I, it, it, it hurt. And David is losing all of these things. He's losing his best friend. He's losing his wife. He's losing his position. He's losing all of these things. But it's not done yet. Look at chapter 21, verses 10 through 15. And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish in the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Remember, I said this song will come up several times in 1 Samuel. And David took these words to heart 
and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the door of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see this man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this, shall this fellow come into my house? We see David is losing the crutch of dignity and self-respect. Now this guy was the king of Gath. You guys remember who's from Gath? This big, ugly guy named Goliath. <laughs> That's where Goliath is from. This is enemy headquarters. And their greatest, most powerful, most prominent warrior has been killed by the guy trying to show up at the porch looking for refuge. He realized, hey, I, I can't do this. He begins to spit in his mouth and pretend that he's absolutely insane. He's trying to, uh, to, to not get himself killed. Understand, David was a confident. The Bible says he was a handsome guy. David was the George Clooney of his time, and David was a handsome dude. The Bible said he had pretty eyes, whatever that means. He looked good. I and mean, this is a guy who was a confident guy when you see him interacting with soldiers and generals. And he's leading armies. He's got wives now. All that, man, is gone. Now he's on the run like a fugitive, like a criminal, pretending to spit all over himself, pretending to be a madman. And lastly, we see he loses the crutch of home. Look at me in chapter 22. We'll look in verses 1 through 2. David departed there and escaped to the cave at Adullam. When his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And listen to this, verse 2. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who wasn't bitter in soul gathered to him. Oh, doesn't that just sound like a delightful crew to be around? <laughs> and he became a commander over them, and there with them about 400 men. You see David losing the crutches in his life, and it leads him to this cave that I want to spend a couple of minutes on. We see the second scene is David hiding in this cave. He's losing the crutches, but now he's in this cave at Adullam. It's about 17 miles southwest of Jerusalem. And uh, imagine, not that long ago, David was in a palatial circumstances. People were singing his praises, and, and now he's in a dark, dank cave. Now, I've seen a lot of caves. And they're pretty, their formation, some of them. But I never thought for one second, ah, I'd like to live here. I'd like to spend more than an hour here. I never thought that. Dark and dank. So David, this isn't just a physical cave that he's in. He is in a spiritually dark place, as we'll read on. Now we see that David's family comes to him in this cave, but not likely uh, to show him support and encouragement. We know his brother is already kind of jealous of him. They're probably hiding from Saul themselves and, and fearing reprisals. And so, so this family has to come and hide in the cave with him as well. Then we see they're gathered together with distressed, which in the Hebrew really means under pressure, people who are in debt, who can't pay their debts, and people who are bitter of so, see, the kingdom, when things aren't going well with the king, gets tumultuous. Problems begin to grow. And that's what was happening in Israel. Misery loves company. So he's with the down and outs, and he becomes their commander. He becomes the Robin Hood of this not so merry men. Now, Scripture lets us peek back a little bit in this story. Do you guys want to do that with me? So the Bible says we, we get this narrative, but then we see in the book of Psalms, 
that David uh, writes about this experience. He writes about what he was dealing with, and so God gives us that. So he lets us peel back the curtain a little bit, and we get to see how David was feeling and what he was experiencing. So turn with me in Psalm 142. Psalm 142, and we're going to look in verses 1 through 4, and we'll look at the rest in a bit. Psalm 142, verses 1 through 4. This is what David is dealing with while he is in the cave. And, and we have this kind of superscription at the top of the psalm. And those are there on purpose. Those are inspired just like the rest of the psalm is inspired. It says, a mascal of David when he was in the cave, a prayer. And this is what David writes about his time there. He says, with my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see there is no one who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. And that's a dark place to be at. David, surrounded by people, is utterly alone and hurt. Make no mistake, friend, just because we're surrounded here or you're surrounded other places, you can be in a crowd of people and feel utterly alone. And David says, there's not one person in this whole world who cares for my soul. It's a dark cave experience. David felt utterly alone, like he didn't have a friend in the world. I, I read this passage, and I just want to hug David. Don't you want to hug him when he says that? He's like, man, I just want to say, man, it's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. Um, it just breaks my heart to read how he was feeling at this time. You know, I can relate to that at least to a certain extent. I can remember a time in my life in deep, dark depression. It's hard to remember it now because my life is so different. But I can remember a lot time in my life when I would cry myself to sleep at night and because I, I hated waking up in the morning. And I would hate going to bed, and I would hate waking up because I hated life. I just remember being in a dark, lonely, and I felt like nobody cared for my soul. Now, it's not true, by the way. I had people that cared for my soul, but in that dark, cave experience of depression and loneliness that's what I felt like and David to a greater extent I think really did feel that see David was quickly losing what holds most people up important to understand David hadn't done anything wrong at this point right David did exactly what God's been telling him to do David was uh, minding his own business watching sheep and then God sends somebody to him to bother him, to get in his life. And then he says, okay, God, I'll be the next king. Whatever, that's fine. Then, and then he says, oh, I'm going to go over here and feed my brothers. And then, then he fights this big giant. And then God moves him in all these places. And now a madman wants to kill him. He's going, God, what have I done? I've been obedient. I've done what you've told me to do. But slowly, all of these crutches that he was hanging on to were being pulled out of his life. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that these crutches are inherently sinful or evil. But David was soon to find out that these crutches were taking the place of God. They were substitutes for God. Many people hang on to these crutches. The Bible says David didn't lose hope, and we're going to read uh, the, the latter part of Psalm here in just a second. There's a lot of lessons we can get from this cave experience. Maybe you're in a cave of circumstances. Things just haven't gone your way. Trials and tribulations and difficulties have come your way. And you're in a cave and you're struggling right now. And it wasn't necessarily something that you've done. But you're in this cave and it's dark and it's lonely. Maybe you're in a cave of consequences that you've done wrong, that you've done sin, and sin always bears with it a price, a 
It always has a consequence. It always hurts. It always harms. And so maybe you're in a cave of your own consequences, or maybe it's a little bit of both. But whatever the reason is, you feel like you're in a, a, a cave experience. Maybe you've been there before. Life has a way of putting you in a cave, doesn't it? Life has a way of putting us in dark, challenging times for the, the, the couple that held hands and said, I do, and in their hearts they believed and they promised each other that they would be there with each other forever. Things didn't work out that way. Before we know it, lawyers are involved and they're signing papers and life says, get back in the cave. You stay in there. You get dark. You get lonely. Maybe you worked really hard and, and, and you put a lot of time and energy in, into this, and this business and this practice and, and, and then all of a sudden circumstances didn't work out and you're filing for bankruptcy and life says, man, get back in the cave. And that there was a love in your life and it's been lost. Life says, get back in the cave. And you can relate to what David's dealing with. And I give you just a couple of principles from this passage. First principle is this. Drop the crutches. Drop them. You guys with me? Are you awake here? I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm just checking. I'm just, boy. Drop the crutches. Throw them down. That's what we learn in this passage. The problem with crutches is they can be substitutes for God the things that only God should be, the place that, uh, that our heart should only uh, have held uh, sacred for God and the things that He can do and, and the trust that we place on Him. Crutches uh, get, get, get used for that, and, and, and they don't have to be evil things. Family is not evil, but it can be used as a crutch. And work is not evil, but it can be used as a crutch. Dreams are not evil, but they can be used as a crutch. Are you with me, church? And they become problems, they become evil, they become wrong because they are substitutes for only God should be. Crutches are wrong or problematic because they give us a horizontal focus. They help us to look at this problem and, and this life's problem and, 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 and circumstances that surround my life. But the Bible says that there is a life to come. Right, church? And that what we live here is just a speck. It's just a speck of what eternity is. And so when our circumstances, when our crutches make us just look here, they're making us where we can't see what we should be seeing. And God says, open your eyes and see eternally as I see. If you're only seeing the temporary, then you're not seeing enough. Substitutes only give temporary relief. Maybe that bottle does relieve it for a little while. Maybe those drugs relieve it for a little while. Maybe that relationship relieves it for a little while. Maybe your workaholism relieves it for a little while, but all of them disappear. They're temporary. It's like juicy fruit gum, man. That gum is delicious for about five seconds, and then it's gone, man. And I'm telling you, temporary relief. That's the way it is. It's a substitute. Crutches. And they're good for a little while. And they're gone. You guys remember the movie Forrest Gump? You all remember that movie? It's a weird movie. But, uh, so, but, and you all remember this iconic scene in Forrest Gump, right? It's uh, Forrest when he was a little boy, and he's hanging out with his friend, Jenny. And they're talking and hanging out, and some bullies come up. They start throwing rocks at Forrest. And if you remember Forrest, his legs are, are bow-legged or something's wrong with him. I don't remember exactly. But he's got these big, bulky, metal, clanky, clunky braces that try to keep him walking straight. And then she utters a very famous line in cinematic history. She says, what? Run, Forrest, run. Man, you guys are really good at that. I wasn't ready for that. She says, run, Forrest, run. That was good. You know what Forrest does? He runs. He takes off. At first, he's not doing too well. He's clanking. He's clunking. He's tripping. The guys are, are catching up to him. But then something happens, right? He begins to run in slow motion. Is it, I don't know why. He's slow motion. He starts running kind of straight. And what happens? 
those braces, those crutches, they start coming off. And then all of a sudden, he starts running real fast. And they just shatter off of him. And he outruns the enemies, and they can't catch him anymore. You see, he learned what he thought was holding him up was holding him back. Now, are you with me, church? Uh, and, and I wrote this on the screen, right? Can you all read this with me? Y'all got the forest part, right? So maybe you can read this part. What you think is holding you up may be holding you back. So they're never good the first time. Let's try it again. Okay. What you think is holding you up may be holding you back. And I really believe that. There's a lot of people that are hanging on to these crutches. And they're saying, God, this is gonna, this is gonna make me significant. This is gonna make me feel good. This is gonna make me happy. And the things that you think are holding you up are actually holding you back from who God wants you to be. The crutches keep you from being what God wants you to be and what God wants you to do. Spiritual crutches keep you from the destiny that God has for you, that God has plans and purposes for you, and He wants to use you in mighty and powerful and significant ways. But we hang on to these crutches, and instead of leaping through life, we begin to limp. Matthew 10, 39 says, Jesus says, whoever finds his life, lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, find it. Man, it's powerful. Jesus didn't say, and go take your life. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, this is what you need. If, if, if you want to have a life of significance, you must lose your life, and then you will gain it. C.S. Lewis helped me understand this passage with this, with this quote. And he said, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you get neither. Are you with me, church? Jesus said, if you want this life to matter, then you must care about the next. And when you start caring about the next, when you give up your life, when you say, I don't need the praise of the world, I don't need the, the, the feel good, I don't need the accolades of the, the world, I don't need those things, I want God's glory in my life, I want God's purposes in my life. When you do those things, he said, once you lose your life, then you begin to see life in the proper perspective. But Jesus said, for those who only see this life, they don't really see life as it is. And if you're just living for this life, then you've already lost your life. Because you want to gain life, Jesus says you better lose it. So drop the crutches. Let go of them. They're not holding you up, they're holding you back. And let's look at the next and final principle. You read the rest of Psalm 142 with me in verses 5 through 7. Last verse we read in verse 4, it says, No refuge remains to me, no one cares for my soul. But look at verse 5, it says, I cry to you, O Lord. I say that you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. See, David was down, but he wasn't out. See, David was, was hurt enough to pay attention. Sometimes that's the only way that God can get our attention. He said, God, let me do my own thing. Let me have health, wealth, and happiness, and all the things of this life. And God says, you're missing what this life is all about. Sometimes the only way we listen is when we are and David was hurting, and so he was paying attention. But David was honest enough to cry out to God. You know God knows what you think. He knows what you feel. He knows what you've done. And so David recognized all of that, and so David was honest before God. He said, this is where I'm at, God. He said, I feel like not one single person in this world cares about me, and it hurts, and I'm lonely, and I'm scared. 
it, but I'm going to put my trust in you. He was down. Oh, man, but he wasn't out. But then David, as you see over and over again in his life, that he was humble enough to listen to God. That I, I'm listening, God. He says, you're my, my refuge. You're my deliverer. You're my, my chain breaker. He said, God, I, I listen to you. I put my trust in you. You know, woodworkers, they'll put uh, veneer on wood, won't they? Uh, veneer is a, a, a thin piece of wood that you put on some other wood. Usually the veneer is a, a, a more expensive type of wood, or it looks like, and so you put it on cheaper wood to make it look better, right? And so you put veneer over wood that's a little bit rough. You put a veneer on wood to make it look better than it really is. People in church do that all the time. Maybe you're doing it this morning. Maybe in your heart of hearts that you're hurting, but man, when the pastor says, how you doing? Oh, I'm fine, brother. <laughs> doing well, doing well. Doing great. Doing great. How the family? Great, good, wonderful. Thank you for asking. And you paste a smile on your face. And you put on a veneer. People don't know you're hurting. God knows you're hurting, but you're not being honest with Him. You pride and Fear will keep you from honesty. And pride and fear will keep you from real help. There's people I know in this church who have dealt with and are dealing with marriage troubles, but they're hanging on to it and they're putting on this veneer and saying, no, no, I'm fine, we're fine, leave us alone. There's people I know in this church who have struggles with uh, addictions. And they're saying, no, I I I'm fine, I'm fine, just, just leave me alone. There's people who are, are broken and are hurting in this church. And they're saying, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, leave me alone. The people have problems. Don't believe for one minute that everybody in this church is okay. You understand? Don't believe it. And you can wear a nice belt, nice outfit, and you can clean yourself up, but don't believe for one minute minute that everybody in this church is okay i'm not always okay i got problems right and so do you so let's not pretend to be what we are not not everybody in this church is okay and that's okay in his cave in his low point david realized that god was his refuge that god was his deliverer that god was his chain breaker i'm telling you brothers and sisters as christians we have a name for that person right his name is jesus the bible says that jesus is our refuge he is our ever-present help in times of need that he is our deliverer that jesus delivered us from sin and from shame and and, and before we loved him he loved us and if we place our faith and trust in Him, He delivers us. The Bible says that Jesus is our chain breaker. That we don't have to live in sin. We don't have to be ruled by sin. We don't have to live in guilt, shame, and fear anymore as a believer. Because the Bible says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And for that the Son has set you free, brothers and sisters, you are free indeed is what the Bible says about Jesus Christ. And so we love Him. We love our chain breaker. We love our refuge. We we love our deliverer when we worship Jesus Christ because he is worthy of our praise. And brother, he's brother and sister, he's a crutch that will not fail and will not falter. Jesus can protect you, he can heal you, he can help you, he can comfort you, he can console you, deliver, strengthen, break your chains, and he can save your soul. And so, brothers and sisters, I can't do any of those things. I can't do one of those things. That's why we're here worshiping Jesus and not me and not worshiping a praise team because Jesus is the only person who can do those things. If you're in a spiritual cave, turn to Christ. Turn to Christ and turn to his people. People who love you. People who care for you. People that have struggles just like you. 
through the power of Jesus Christ have overcome them. Now people say that Christianity is a crutch. Ever heard that before? Christianity is for weak people. You know what the response for that is? Yep. (laughs) That Jesus is my crutch. I can't get through life on my own. I can't accomplish anything of significance without him. But when somebody tells me that, I said, that's right, Jesus is my crutch. What's yours? Right? What's your crutch? Because we all have crutches. That person ain't leaning on Jesus. He's leaning on his career. And you think he's a big shot. But careers come and they go. Maybe that crutch is his health. And the person says, uh, uh, look what I can do. Look what I've accomplished. And health comes and goes. Maybe that crutch is that person's family. But family comes and goes. What is your crutch? Is Jesus in a good spot? If it's not, you're in a dangerous place. I want you to know, friends, that this church is a place of refuge. You don't have to act for me. You don't have to act for anybody else. You don't have to act for God. This place, this church, is a place of refuge. And you can come here with your sin and with your struggles and with your pain and with your joys, and we can celebrate that, and we can cry together, and we can hug together, and we can be together because this is a refuge. A church that takes refuge together under Jesus Christ. Christ.